Hello friends, in the 320 BC, the ravages which had followed in the wake of Alexander's conquests opened the door even wider for the revolution in lifestyle already underway. So it comes as no surprise that in the Hellenistic age, there developed a new type of theater, engineering a change that would forever alter the look of comedy. The focus of drama shifted to the fears and foibles of richer than average people in Athens and their struggles to keep family and fortune alive. In the process of this evolution, later Greek comedy created a vision of life very different from that of old comedy. From about the time of Alexander's coming to power, the comedy written is called New Comedy. Very little of this comedy is extant. Major chunk of information about it is gathered from the plays of Plautus and Terence, the Roman comic playwrights who borrowed extensively from New Comedy. The role of the chorus was severely diminished in New Comedy. By Menander's day, in fact, the chorus had declined so far that choral odes were completely disconnected from the main play. Choristers instead sang Embolima, the inserted songs, which were often four in number in New Comedy. Thus, the play was divided into five acts. Menander's partly extant arbitration at least seems to have been so divided into artistically constructed units. This was a natural development of the usage of tragedy where the episodes were so constructed. However, such division was not being slavishly followed by the Greek dramatists of the 4th century. The omniscient prologue was almost indispensable in plays which exploited dramatic irony based on hidden identities. Hence, the Euripidean prologue became the rule with dramatists using this type of material, especially Diphilus and Menander. Menander however, was fond of opening his plays with a dramatic prelude and inserting the prologue within the action. This was especially effective in plays which required elaborate exposition from two different point of views. One is displayed before and the other after the prologue. The use of a divinity for omniscient prologues was still popular. Just as Hermes speaks the prologue in Ion by Euripides, so the goddess ignorance, actually the patron divinity of much of new comedy, speaks the prologue in the shearing of Glycera and the star Arcturus in the rope by Plautus, to say nothing of Mercury in the Amphitryon. Sometimes, however, a mere prologue speaker served as a more obvious emissary of the poet, when the matter to be explained did not require omniscience, a character of the play might be employed, though such a character in Plautus might reveal the name of the Greek original or impart knowledge which later as a character in the action he did not possess. Though 
The incidents of new comedy are often highly improbable. The plots themselves are usually simple. Terence, it is true, had a definite formula for main and minor plot. He developed this in his first play, The Woman of Andrus, by adding a character. In four other plays, he may have found it ready-made in the Greek originals. Two young men are in love, one with a virtuous girl and the other usually with an ordinary courtesan. The problem of one is solved by recognition of the girl as an attic citizen of good birth and that of the other by securing money through an intrigue. The two actions are closely knit and nicely complicate each other. Such a plot furnishes an ample amount of dramatic business. Other types of double plots are found such as that of pot of gold by Plotus where Eucleo and his gold are the main concern of the play. But the future of his daughter and her lover is an important and closely associated secondary interest. Usually, however, only one young man is concerned and his problem is solved either by recognition or by securing money. Such a plot tends to be too slight. Padding of low comedy is inserted and sometimes as in Braggart Warrior by Plotus, a minor action is clumsily suspended within the major one without really contributing anything to it. My dear students, the solution of a play of new comedy must be a happy one. Often it is saccharinely happy, though sometimes it has a touch of tartness as in Brothers by Terence or Twin Minicomy by Plotus. Frequently, this solution leans heavily upon the long arm of coincidence, such as the arrival of Crito in Woman of Andrus by Terence, and sometimes the resolving character resembles very much an improperly used deus ex machina as Calidamates does in Haunted House by Plotus. The subject matter of new comedy was taken almost exclusively from the everyday life of the upper middle class at Athens. It was much more generalized in subject and in appeal and came to depend not on the mad, ebuoyant hopes of renegade reformers like Diceopolis or Lysistrata of Aristophanes, the dramas personae consumed with some great notion about how to cure society's ills, but relied instead on the fortuitous favours of a hostile world run on luck and money. Its sons and its fathers are very much like sons and fathers of any age and its milieu of family life is perhaps the richest mine of comic material. The general social background of Athens during the Hellenistic age, though based on slavery, was a highly enlightened one. It was a brilliant backdrop for light comedy. Still, the generalization of the material and abstraction from the historical background leads to a monotonous repetition of the same plots 
and the same situations. Perhaps the custom of tragedies reusing the same legends lent a specious justification for this. Certainly, the heartiest reader of new comedy becomes surfeited with the son's need of money for his sweetheart and with the machinations of the clever slave to secure this money from the father. Eventually tiring also is the recognition of long lost children who end up living next door to their grieving parents. Young men compromising women who seem to be prostitutes but fortuitously turn out to be marriageable maidens in love with their attacker and gentile courtesans welcoming home nubile virgin sisters to the lusty arms of well-meaning and well-endowed Athenian bachelors. It is as if the world were made of nothing but rescue plays. Not a single one of Menander's plays, we are told by Ovid, lacked its love affair. Yet he wrote more than a hundred. Indeed, the length to which even the best poets went in reworking the same plot is almost incredible. That a young man should unknowingly marry the very girl whom he has previously violated, for instance, would seem an extravagant improbability to be used once perhaps in light comedy. But Menander employed it repeatedly. The results of studied analysis, however, should not be allowed to dominate one's first impression of the plays. This is often favorable for the endless variation of minor details makes the better plays appear fresh and original. The dramatists themselves were not always blind to their shortcomings and some such as the author of the captives made distinct efforts to work into new material. Occasionally too a dramatist disgusted with the superficial will press his plowshare deeper into the old ground and turn up something really remarkable such as the plotine truculentus. Still the Athens of this period was a far more colorful city than we should judge from new comedy and the dramatists did not fully exploit the possibilities of their contemporary world. The moral code of new comedy, though not obvious to the modern reader, is a strict one. It frankly accepts the double standard. A husband's infidelities are often depicted as in the twin Menechmi, but usually such a husband is made utterly ridiculous. This is certain to be the case if a father becomes the rival of his son. But a wife's deliberate infidelities, though the subject of incidental jests in old comedy, are here stringently excluded. Indeed, even unwilling infidelity such as that of Alchemine is admitted only when it is a well established legendary tradition. No man ever marries a girl who has been intimate with another man, though virtuous girls who have been held as slaves are often married. In such cases, however, their virtue is made unmistakably plain and stress upon this foreshadows recognition. There are many cases where maidens of good family have been violated, but invariably 
the young man is made to take the honours of this and the maiden's character is saved by the assurance that force was employed. Indeed, in tragedy, which is allowed more frankness in this regard, the frailty of woman is readily admitted. The indulgent attitude toward a young man in such cases may shock the modern reader. To the Greeks, it has been most aptly said, a baby without a wedding was a better guarantee of love and union than a wedding without a baby. That no ordinary courtship in the modern sense of the term is found in new comedy is not the fault of the dramatist. It simply did not exist in the society of contemporary Athens. Girls of good family were held in the strictest surveillance, which they were apparently unable to elude except at the great festivals. Such festivals incidentally are quite beyond the imagination of a modern reader unless he has seen a Latin Mardi Gras or unless he has been a visitor in Athens for a Greek Easter or a feast of St. George. Marriage in ancient Athenian life was arranged by the parents and the principals had often scarcely seen one another before the ceremony. The haste of the arrangements in comedy, however, should be attributed to dramatic exigencies. The message of new comedy seems to be that fate will in time take care of the beleaguered, if only they'll await salvation. Gods, if they cameo at all on the stage of new comedy, are less likely to hail from the traditional Olympian caucus than the halls of academe, where pseudo-scientific deities like Philemon's heir or Menander's ignorance rule. For example, a goddess named Misapprehension delivers the prologue of Menander's The Shawn Girl or The Rape of the Locks. The personified abstractions naturally rule a philosophical era like the Hellenistic age. Thus, no longer do gods in the traditional sense bring salvation, but it is the consideration of stars that redeems the suffering of those who sit at home and watch and hope and reason. As a result, the post-classical theatre was both a grim reflection of the darkling world around it and a haven from the storm outside or at least a brief respite from glowing reality. New comedy was an accurate but never too detailed picture of the world it inhabited and eventually it became a way of life unto itself. The language of new comedy is designed to give the impression of being that of everyday speech. But actually, it is a highly artistic development, strongly influenced by European dialogue. It is simple and natural, especially in the hands of the master stylist Menander. But the extremes of colloquialism are carefully avoided. The meter too is extremely simple. Greek new comedy employed conventional costumes and masks. These devices allowed an actor to take more than one role and thus reduce the expense of production. They also aided the audience not provided with handbills 
in readily identifying characters. The greatest shortcoming of new comedies theatre however is its inability to portray an interior scene which was a marked handicap for comedies of ordinary family life. One must not therefore be too severe in his criticism of the dramatists if entrances and exits are occasionally awkward for even the most intimate scenes must somehow be brought out in front of the house on the street. These various limitations and the narrowness of its outlook along with the demand of ancient audience that comedy must amuse and delight had a paralyzing effect on the genre. Indeed, new comedy never gave any real promise of developing into serious drama. It is clever and amusing and delightful. Nothing more should be expected of it. Dramatists far and wide played intelligently with these conventions and with traditional Greek character types to the point that only one of the consummate masters, Menander, was an Athenian by birth. His greatest rival, Philemon, a close contemporary of Alexis, hailed from the Greek world outside Athens, as did his slightly younger comrade Diphilus, who was born in Asia Minor. Not that either lived as an adult anywhere but Athens, which was still the magnet that attracted dramatic talent from all quarters. The trio of Menander, Diphilus and Philemon became the most famous playwrights of Greek new comedy, a post-classical comic triad comparable to Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides. Like Euripides, however, Menander eventually emerged triumphant from that trio. He was later dubbed the star of new comedy. He had a warm and all-pervading humor, a marvelous deftness in depicting characters, and an impeccable taste and discrimination where sentiment was concerned. These were his virtues, the virtues of a genial and brilliant bon vivant, living an aristocratic life in an affluent but basically decadent age. And we need not be astonished if we do not find in his face the profoundly thoughtful brow or the tragic mouth of Euripides. Though Menander's dramatic activity extended only some 30 years, he is said to have written slightly more than 100 comedies. Of these, only the recently discovered arbitration is preserved for somewhat more than half the play, although lengthy fragments of other plays also have been found. Roman adaptations of his plays are extant in three plays of Plautus, the two Bacchides, the Casket and the Stychus, possibly also the Pot of Gold and the Carthaginian and in four plays of Terence, the woman of Andrus, the self-tormentor, the eunuch and the brothers. Philemon, we are told, during his lifetime won more first place awards than Menander at the Lanea and the city Dionysia. To judge from what little remains of the original text, Philemon seems to have dwelt at some length on philosophical issues that happen to be currently in vogue, which would go some distance to explaining his popularity in his day 
and the subsequent loss of interest in his drama once those issues had passed from immediate public attention. Philemon also was not a true Athenian coming from Solo in Sicilia or from Syracuse though he was later given Athenian citizenship. He is said to have been active as comic poet to the very end of his hundred years and according to one account he died from excessive laughter. The number of his comedies is placed at 97. The plot iron merchant and three bob day are taken from his plays, perhaps also the haunted house. Diphilus was born not at Athens but at Sinope on the Black Sea. He was a contemporary and rival of Menander. He is said to have written 100 plays. Cassina and Rope by Plotus are taken from originals by Diphilus. Not to mention the fragmentary tale of a travelling bag and the lost suicide pact. Comedy of Diphilus is not easy to gauge. As with Philemon, only tattered remnants of his works survive in Greek. Both Plotus and Terence, living a century or so later, adapted the works of Diphilus. If any single thing stands out as characteristic of Diphilian comedy, it is a flair for broad comedy and farcical violence in keeping with the love of Aristophanes for strong dramatic effects on stage. Curiously then, if anyone on the post-classical Athenian stage was the immediate heir of Aristophanes, it was not his native countryman Menander but Diphilus. Thank you. Thank <music> you.